at the end of the day, the team productivity goes up. And, and in my head, everything I think about is how do I get the team productivity to go up? And when they're happy and they produce more, that's a, that's a win all the way around. Chad Peterman here, and you are listening to Can't Stop the Growth, a platform for leaders and teams to grow and thrive. We highlight the importance of personal development, pursuing greatness, and always chasing your potential. Let's get into it. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Can't Stop the Growth. I'm your host, Chad Peterman, and today I have a very special guest on the podcast. All business leaders are looking for the best ways to inspire their, our teams and hold them accountable. Our guest isn't just a team builder, he's a team revolutionizer, making him an invaluable voice for any discussion on scaling profitable businesses through exceptional team dynamics. I'm so extremely excited to welcome Bill Lennon to the podcast. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Chad. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Bill and I were chatting before we kicked off. You know, it's always funny when you have a guest on the, uh, on the podcast and uh, you in your own business, uh, me in this case have a ton of questions because this is one thing you're always working through. So excited to talk to you and, and learn a little bit more about your work and what you've done over the course of your career. I guess to kind of as a starting point, why don't, uh, if you don't mind, kind of give us a little bit of your background and what you've done and that way listeners kind of have a, a point of reference, if you will. I've done a bunch of different kinds of things over the span of my life. The last 25 years has been in Silicon Valley. Uh, designing products and running software teams. I started off writing code for a living and then built my first team and then built another team with doing product management and, and, and running engineering teams. And the thing that was interesting was how they kept delivering amazing results over and over and over again, well beyond what everybody else said was possible. And me finally realizing after doing this for a decade plus that what I was doing was unusual and then finding a partner who could help me reverse engineer and actually break it down so that now what I, what I see as great leadership is a consistent, repeatable process that is driven by mental models, how we think about things, and then the skills that we leverage to, to take those mental models and make them actionable. Not only have I done this, but also I've looked around and, and deconstructed how great leaders in a variety of contexts, both ones that I've worked for, as well as, as, uh, as other people that I've met, like how, what they're doing is exactly the stuff that we're teaching. I always say that the the recipe for, uh, uh, for great leadership is simple, but it's not easy. It's almost too simple. It's like, hold on. So I only have to do this. Yeah. You just got to do that consistently. Tell us a little bit more about that. I'm very intrigued by the idea of a mental model. I've never heard that term before. I'm guessing there's some things that I've heard before in it, but, but explain, that, explain that piece of, of what you're doing. Fundamentally, everybody operates in the world out of their mental models, their beliefs. Like you've got a belief that if you hop in the car and you turn the key, it's, the motor's going to start up because there's evidence over time that that's how it works, right? You have a mental model around the value of entrepreneurship and the business that you're building, right? We have lots and lots of different mental models. One of the things that, that I realized in the process of doing the reverse engineering of my successes was that I had a stack of mental models that a lot of other people in leadership roles didn't carry. And that was the difference, right? One of the mental models I had was that my, and this was when I was a first level team lead was that my job was to make my team as productive as possible. That that was the most important thing I could be doing because that team can produce more work than I can by myself, no matter how good I am. And I was fortunate in that when I was building my first team, my boss, who was the CEO of the company, explicitly said this to me one day. He said, your job is to make your team as productive as possible. At that point in time, I think I had uh, like eight or 10 people. He's like, no matter what you do, you can't. Do, you can't outwork them, right? And, and you just have to get that your job is about making them super effective. I don't care if you ever, like you could never write code again, I'll be totally happy. It's about making them effective. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that's a shift, right? Because before that, I was trying to balance getting code written and getting them to be effective. And I was struggling because I just, I couldn't figure out how to get the time happen. One of the mental models is that as the team lead, 
I should be willing to be emotionally uncomfortable in service of my team and that I need to have emotional resilience so that I can step into uncomfortable situations because my team needs that. And that's really empowering because there's lots of stuff that we can do as team leaders that are scary. That's just the bottom line, right? And we have to figure out how do I approach this? How do I get into that environment? How do I get into that context to be effective despite my fear? There's a whole stack of clinically researched and proven skills for, for being emotionally uncomfortable called distress tolerance. My partner who helped me reverse engineer this is a um, mental health clinician. And part of what came out of this along the way was that I learned a lot of distress tolerance skills as a kid and I autopiloted that and I brought it into my professional world. Part of what we teach people is all the same things that I've been using, all this, these skills that I've been using that allow me to get uncomfortable in the service of the team. Yeah, I think that's extremely powerful. I knew when you said mental model, I hadn't heard the term, but I was going to probably agree with a lot of what you said. One of the things, this, this um, uh, podcast primarily serves people in the home services, and you're dealing with a lot of field professionals and different things like that. And there's a lot of mental models that have been pre-constructed before we came in. And I was lucky. I didn't, I grew up around my dad's business, but would never got into the trade. So I didn't have a lot of these kind of, you know, uh, mental models already built. I was kind of a clean slate. What advice would you give? Because one of the things that I struggle with, and I know some of our listeners do too, is helping people deconstruct the model that they have to potentially accept a new one that's going to be more beneficial. Yeah, um, it's, a gr- it's a great question. The, the approach that, that we take is the first thing is to figure out where you're uncomfortable. Where's the emotional discomfort, right? Um, I used to have really bad social anxiety and I realized, I mean, and I, I knew it because I was a shy introvert and I couldn't network. The old me would never have been on this podcast. And so I, a friend of mine helped me start to nibble away at that, right? But the first thing was I had the, the recognition of number one, I've got a desire. I want to be comfortable networking because I need to do this for my career but I'm terrified to go to networking events. And it's that, that friction there. Like when we recognize the friction, like, okay, what am I afraid of? Right. One of our philosophical perspectives, one of our mental models is that nothing in the world is hard. Everything is easy. If you have the right mental model and the skills and you've practiced it, doesn't matter what it is. I'm just starting to learn how to use a chainsaw. There's a, there's a whole learning curve with, with using a chainsaw. And I have friends that have been doing it for decades and for them, it's super easy. You know, and for me, I'm like fumbling and the chains popping off and like all this stuff, right? It's just a matter of what's the mental models and what's the skills and the practice. And that applies to everything, you know, everything I've ever done, I, I can look at it and reverse engineer it in that direction. And so if something is hard for somebody, number one, being honest and going, wow, this is really uncomfortable and hard, which takes a level of courage to do that. I freely admit it. But then saying, okay, someone who's good at this what are the mental models that they have and what are the skills they have? And oftentimes it's the skill stack that got them to this place. We use swimming as an analogy a lot because people understand it, right? Michael Phelps is a great swimmer, but his ability to swim is a stack. He started off holding his breath in the water, just like everybody else. And then he learned a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. You can learn how to swim but you're not going to get to be his level unless you put in all the levels of work that he put in. One of my challenges early on was I thought everybody shared the same mental models that I did. I didn't think that any of my mental models were unusual. And so when my peers would say, I can't do that, I was confused because I was like, why can't you? And it took a while and really took my partner doing the, uh, the reverse engineering and really helping me see, oh, wait a minute. I'm carrying a mental model that it's okay to be emotionally uncomfortable in service of my teams. Other people aren't carrying that mental model. And and frankly, part of it is do the practice, like do this, do the swimming, right? The first day that you put your face in the water, you're probably not going to be super comfortable. But if you've been swimming competitively for five years, putting your face in the water, you don't even think about it anymore. Really seeking out that discomfort, I think is, is really a light bulb moment for me, at least of like, 
okay. And, and it's true, right? I would totally relate with being an introvert and people that meet me now will like, you're on a podcast and you speak and you do all these things. You're not an introvert. I'm like, no, 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 I am. I am. Ask the people that, uh, that know me best. I am indeed. But it was that mental model of if I'm going to lead a team, if I'm going to build a company, I can't be an introvert. I can be an introvert when I'm at home and, you know, sit on the couch or do whatever. But when I'm with my team, I have to be who they need me to be. And I think it's that that shift from, you know, what do I need to be comfortable to, like you said, what does my team need of me for them to be comfortable? Exactly. One of the mental models that I didn't have to begin with and, and, and one of my early CEOs gave me was that on a day-to-day -day basis, the most important people in the company are the frontline individual contributors. And I'm sorry if you have your own company that you run and I'm downgrading your value, but unless you're on the front line, you're actually doing the sales, you're building the, the, the product, you're, you're doing the work, um, you're insulated from making money, right? Unless you're actually doing the sales conversations, right? And getting contracts signed or building a house or whatever the services are that are being done, writing code, you're insulated from the day-to-day -day behavior and you don't have the, the immediate impact of productivity. But the first level team leads have all the impact because they're available on a day-to-day -day basis to help those people level up whatever it is they're doing. And this was the thing that I found so fascinating was, you know, no matter what the CEO said, right? It was really, how did I interact with the team to get them to level up and, and perform better and, and be happy about it? A core part of this is you have to do it in such a way that your team doesn't hate you and that they feel a lot of ownership and accountability in the stuff that they're producing. And so the way that you frame this when you're talking with them is really important so that they get that they own the outcomes and they get rewarded for it. We do um, some work with DISC profiling just to understand communication styles, to understand how people are wired. Have you gone in, in your research and, and what you've built, have you dug in? Because I, I feel like these mental models are often crafted as we're growing up and we don't know it. Tell me a little bit about that and how you guys kind of maybe unpack that for people that or, or groups that you're working with. So yeah, you're 100% you're right. We all learn mental models growing up. I learned that the water was a playground because that's what my folks, that's how they were. I've run into adults, you know, that don't have that mental model, right? And they didn't grow up with that. And their behavior is very, very different. Whenever I'm operating with a team, and this is one of those things where there is no way to take this and scale it from one to 10,000 people. This is why you have to get the team leads involved and teach them how to do this. Like if I could magically like brain dump this into everybody, that would be amazing, but we don't have that yet, right? It's not like I can run a software update, but it's really being able to understand all the knobs and levers. And I've looked at a bunch of those different kind of profile tests. And the, the, the challenge I run into is for myself, I'll take the test one day and I get whatever score and I come in and I take it five days later, it's completely different. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's not helpful. Right. And so I tend to look at people as very, very individualized and highly malleable. And the malleable part is figuring out what's their desire. What are their self-limiting beliefs? What are their negative mental models? And how do we operate on the negative mental models in such a way to get their desires to be actionable and available and like they can actually do it? I do a lot of one-on-ones that are really all about them telling me what they want, right? I just want to know that. I have a very broad perspective on what it is that I want them to tell me about. Like it's pretty limitless because if there's any way that I can help them with anything, that has an impact on their work performance. And at the end of the day, everything I'm doing is about how do I drive ROI for the company? And so far, I haven't found anything where, you know, my hindsight is, oh, I shouldn't have done that because it seems like it's, there's always a benefit in the, on the business side, this kind of operationalizing of people feeling more effective. Like I've had people on my teams that have been really shy introverts and I have figured out how to get them to be very vocal, very proactive, very high contributors in the, 
in team meetings. And it's been by reversing those, that childhood programming, they should be quiet, right? Patience is one of the pieces. Like I've worked on people for three or four months to make that change happen. And what's fascinating is when it does happen, the team productivity makes a huge jump up because those people are actually really, really smart. They're really smart, but they're afraid to speak up. And when their wisdom comes out, it's really good. And, you know, I, I was at a, at a company and, and they gave me, they gave me a 15 month project and said, you have nine months to get it done. We have no idea how to get it done ourselves. If you don't get it done in nine months, you're fired. That was literally the pep talk. And so I went back to the team and I was like, okay, guys, here's the deal. And they were like, oh, well, we don't want to lose you. We'll get done in time. And I was like, thank you. I appreciate that. We got done in eight months and we had enough time between when we finished the, all the software that we had to literally completely architect from scratch. We had nothing on day one. We had to do everything. We had time to do super thorough training for the team before we went live for, for the whole company. And after it was over, you know, the executives were like, how did you do that? Like we were literally all getting ready to fire you. And then you delivered it. We can't do that. How'd you do that? I got the friction out of the team. That was what I did. Part of the friction was the shy people not speaking up. And by giving them the ability to speak, our velocity went through the roof. Their ownership of outcomes went through the roof. What, what do you see when you go into a company and, and are, are working with their team or, or whatever that looks like for on your side of things? What do you see as kind of some of the most common things of like, oh my God, this company's doing it too. This company's doing it again. Like, what, what are the things that are getting in the way that, that maybe listeners could be cognizant of or maybe even do kind of a self-inventory of like, oh, crap, that's me. Uh, we need to fix that type thing. What, do, what are you seeing out there? So the first thing is a misunderstanding of power dynamics. If you're the first level team lead, you have a phenomenal amount of power inside the company. And people aren't told that. As a first level team lead, you're making everything happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Your people are making everything happen, irrespective of what it is you're doing. And, and a smart executive wants to hear from you because they know that you're on the front lines and you actually have better understanding of the real world than they do. They're insulated, right? And once upon a time, that might have had a really, really good viewpoint of the marketplace. But as, as the company gets bigger and you get more layers of management, the smart CEOs know that they're very insulated from the real world. So understanding that power dynamic is really important. The second thing that I see missing in companies all the time is how do people that are individual contributors get taught and then have opportunities to test their skills so that they can get promoted themselves? It's having that succession planning starting on day one where everybody understands in a clear fashion, hey, we want to promote you, right? Part of our growth is by our people getting better. We want to promote you to the next level. Here's the things that you're going to learn. Here's how you're going to get to practice that. Here's how you're going to prove to the executive team that promoting you is safe and easy and no risk, right? Almost nobody does that. The U.S. military does that. That's about it, right? As soon as you get away from that, it almost disappears. I was super fortunate in college. I went to work in a restaurant where the manager, that was explicitly how he is like, here's the deal. Everybody starts at the bottom. You're going to learn these skills. Here are success metrics to get promoted up the ladder. And we want to promote you. I had no question about how to get promoted there and what to do to move ahead. Companies desperately need that. The employees really, really want that, but they don't get it. The third thing is the importance of learning communication skills, specifically persuasion skills. If I'm a first level team lead and I want you to fund a bunch of new equipment for my team, if I knock on your door and go, hey, Chad, my, my team is complaining because their equipment's old and sloppy and doesn't work well, whatever. That might not be the most effective argument. But if I come in and go, hey, uh, Chad, get a few minutes. I want to sit down and talk to you about money and numbers and helping my team be more productive and drive more ROI. You're probably going to go, really? Okay, tell me about it. And I'm going to say, look, I've done the math. Right now, with our equipment that we have, we can only get this level of effectiveness in this block of time. There's this new equipment on the market that I'm looking at. It'll improve our effectiveness by 20%. And I've done all the math. This stuff's going to pay for itself in less than three months in the man hour cost savings. 
that communicate that ability to communicate and persuade in such a way that you as the decision maker, it's an easy yes, is a skill that first level managers, number one, probably don't know exists. And number two, they're not getting the opportunity in the practice to have those conversations. And they're having, instead, they're coming in with an emotional conversation and they're saying, hey, Chad, my people don't like that they're, that their gear is old and worn and sloppy and whatever else, right? And that's not your hot buttons necessarily. But as soon as I put it in the, in the context of money and, and how, to, how to ROI that, then you pay attention. For me, it's always just been the person who actually takes the time to put a case together. Like, don't just come to me because you got a problem and just throw it on my desk and make it mine. Come with a solution. Come with, hey, I know we have this. I know you're aware of it. Um, here's two things that I found out there. I think this one may be better, but I think it solves our problem uh, here. Okay, that's great. Because at the end of the day, your your manager probably isn't solving the same problem, hopefully not solving the same problems that you're solving. Uh, if you were, then there's not a need for the both of you. But yeah, I think that's 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 really critical. I think the other piece that you said that is something we're actively working on is are those career paths. You know, we talk so much and you hear management and supervisors and team leads. Well, well, Johnny's just not getting it done. It's like, does Johnny know what getting it done means? Maybe, maybe not, you know, or does he have a, you know, well-defined, you know, KPIs and benchmarks that he's supposed to be hitting so that he knows when he's winning too. Because oftentimes I see people that, they're playing the game without a scoreboard. Well, it would be really tough to know if you're winning or losing. I tend to think a lot about helping people understand what the next level looks like. I'm very flexible in how I want my people to operate to get to the results. Software engineering world, right? I got someone who's, they're doing a bunch of backend work focused on databases. And I've had this happen where, you know, someone who was in the database world a lot came to me and said, I want to shift and focus on the front end, which is it's a big change, right? And I'm like, really? Okay, tell me more. And they explained what's going on. And I'm like, oh, okay, I, I understand. How do we get you to start doing that in addition to what you're doing already without losing the quality of your current work and allow them to figure out how to, sh how to shift? That gives them a forward path, which back to ownership and accountability, I really want, right? I don't want to own anything. I, do, I never want to be the smartest person in the room. I want them to have as much ownership as possible. And when they're charting their own course, that, Im that improves that. But I also want them, if they're looking to get a promotion, like here's the responsibilities of the next level up and make sure that they understand that. And I've had, I've had people who at this level they're at right now, they weren't that great. They were okay. They hit their KPIs, but they weren't amazing compared to somebody else. But when they got a promotion, they crushed it. And that's, that's what I'm looking for. Because I told them, like, here's what the, the things are that are happening at the next level. Here's the skills you have to have. Here's the mental models you have to have. Here's the ways to go and test it. And they, they do that. And all of a sudden, they're, they're amazing at the testing for that level. I'm like, uh, okay, we need to get them to this place because I'm seeing the ROI of, of putting them in that context. And... And so I really want to, to scale up that opportunity for them. Yeah, I think that's so, so powerful because so many times I feel like we get it wrong, right? It's like, well, I'm going to judge who I'm going to put as the manager based on their current performance right now. So I'm going to take the best guy and I'm going to move them into that role. And at the end of the day, typically, at least in our business, the best uh, field professional out there that's, you know, doing a bang up job, he's probably really, really good because of a lot of reasons that would make him not a great manager. And that's okay because there is room for him to grow there. It may just not be in that manager's seat. But I think your point is so powerful of how do we give them practice? How do we observe them doing the things that they're going to do? Because I always tell our guys and, and the ones that have moved up from being out in the field and on the front lines to up in, you know, to a manager, I go, you're going to take off your tool belt that you currently use every single day, you're going to put it in the garage and you're going to bring in a new one. It's called a leadership tool belt. And guess what? You don't know how to operate any of those tools unless I give you the training 
and it's going to take time and it's going to be uncomfortable. You know, you know where every tool is now. You could grab it without looking at it. You know exactly how to use it. You know all the tricks and everything like that. But the new one you're putting on completely different. Um, and I think it's it's one us as leaders understanding that there is a difference. And then two, to your point, which I think is so well put, is how do you give them practice? How do we give them a shot to do it? Because we're never going to know if we don't. I try to set up little small experiments for people to see if that's if that's what they want to do. Because, you know, to your point, the person who's an amazing individual contributor, they might say, I want to be a team lead. And then you let them experiment in those in, in small versions of team lead roles without actually having the full responsibility. And I have some people come back and say, I don't want that job. Okay, great. Like, I'm really glad we figured that out now because it's way less expensive, right? If I, if I put them in charge of a whole team and they aren't happy, they're going to impact that whole team's performance. And so I want that whole team to perform and I want the person that's running them to have the, the confidence in themselves because they've already been doing these tests and they've already passed on the flying colors, right? And so it's, here's the tools, here's how they all work, right? Here's your new belt. We're going to figure out how to get 5% of your time to be one, two, three, five different things that you can start experimenting with and see if that's the direction you want to go. And, and if not, no run, no foul. Like it's, it's not a negative performance thing. It's just, we're taking a risk by putting you into this place because you've been saying that's where you want to go. Let's experiment. Let's try it out. And if you decide you hated it, you're, we're cool, right? Then the question becomes, okay, where do you want to go instead? What is the, the upward path that's not team leadership? And from what I've seen, companies have all kinds of options available. They just have to think a little bit creatively about, you know, what's the next level that you want to go into that's going to keep you excited about the work that you're doing? Absolutely. I think those are just great things for, for all leaders to be thinking about, whether you run a company or team lead or whatever it is, you know, your main job is to develop your team. And so one, understanding where do they want to go? Half your team may just be like, hey, I'm really cool just being here. And yeah, I want to keep getting better and have opportunities, but like here's good. And then you may have another that wants to be in a different department altogether. Like you gave the one example of someone wanted to be on a completely different side of a project. But yeah, how do we identify those people? Um, and I think that goes back to, to your, your talk about the mental model, right? It's like understanding that, you know, what is it that these people really want? Because until I tap into what they really want, I'm not going to be very effective at leading them. You know, that's why I do these short one-on-ones every week. I just want to know, like, how's your life? What's going on? What's your desire? If it's that, you know, you're having a problem because our morning meetings with the whole team are getting in the way of you getting your kids to school. Well, let's talk to the team about changing the time then. Like, it's, it's that easy, right? It's like, okay, we'll move it back half an hour. Probably other people on the team have the exact same problem, but no one's mentioned it. So I don't know about it, right? So I'm like, hey, okay, who else delivers their kids to school in the morning? Who else wants the team meeting to be half an hour later? Oh, 95% of the team done. And if somebody, you know, wants it later because they go to the gym first thing in the morning or they go bike or whatever, and, and this makes it easier to make the, all that happen. I'm like, okay, cool. I don't care. At the end of the day, the team productivity goes up. And, and in my head, everything I think about is how to get the team productivity to go up. And when they're happy and they produce more, that's a, that's a win all the way around. The, the point about one-on-ones, it's something we really harp on around here. That's where you're going to find out this stuff. I think the things that I just thought about that I think are important to share, because it was kind of, a, again, an aha for me was speaking to everybody listening. A lot of the things that are bothering your team right now are as simple as what you just gave an example of. They are oftentimes big things. They're very, very minute. But if you can solve those little tiny problems that are just eating at people, all of a sudden the productivity goes through the roof because they know you're listening and you look like the hero and all you did was move the meeting back. Literally didn't affect anybody. Like, everybody good with this? Yeah, who cares? Okay, perfect. Then they're happy. Um, and so I think it's it's being able to lean into those conversations that, as we talked about earlier, may feel uncomfortable at first, but what you'll find is a lot of comfort because I think the the discomfort comes in like, well, what are they going to tell me? And then I got to go figure out. 
I guess the good part is on the other side of that is usually not a whole lot of stuff. Um, and so being able to have those, you know, real, real conversations, understand what's really driving those people, I think is, is extremely critical. Um, if you're going to get the most out of your team, you know, some, some people, they're, they're afraid to talk to you. They're afraid to tell you and, and you just be patient and, and allow them to create their own sense of psychological safety where they're willing to now say, uh, Chad, here's this thing I got going on. And, and, and sometimes it's, they just want to talk about it. It's like being a therapist where just he- they talk about it and they're like, thank you for hearing me. I feel so much better that I got that off my chest. I don't have to do anything. And I'm like, okay, great. I'm glad you're happy. That's super cool. Knowing that my job is about making them more effective, just that just gives me a lot of freedom to look for ways to operationalize. Well, I think it's it's so critical, too, that, you know, oftentimes what I see is the manager is comfortable. Well, we have our service meeting every week. Well, that's fantastic. But every individual on your team needs something different from you in order for them to be successful. So, again, tell me how you're going to facilitate giving them something all individually in a group meeting. It ain't going to work. Uh, there are times for group meetings, you know, hey, there's different things that you need to do if it's a training or something like that. But in order to truly unpack what someone needs to be successful, which at the end of the day is your job as a leader, you have to sit down with them and talk. There's no other way around it. There's no like crossing your fingers, hoping they get better or maybe they'll figure it out. That's just not going to work. I think that's so powerful. And it's something that you know, we continually stress. And I I think that it is one of those things where we have to, just like you and I are doing, you got to kind of unpack. Why are you so uncomfortable having a conversation with one of the people that reports to you? Like what, what is that? Well, I'm not good at this or I'm not, okay, well, let's, let's figure that out. And it, it, to me, I think if we can, if we can do that, I think we're, we're all businesses will be in a better place. If we start unpacking what is actually going to help the individual get a little bit better. So Bill, tell us, I I appreciate you sharing this. Uh, Obviously, as you can tell, I eat this stuff up. This is uh, what I think about on a daily basis. Um, Tell us uh, with what you're doing now, let me in on kind of like if if people are listening like, hey, I really like what he's saying, you know, how could he help me out? All of this stuff. Let us know, what what does that look like? So the way that we implement 40% better is it's a six month engagement. The first eight weeks are all training and homework. And it's giving people things to practice, like set up one-on-ones with your whole team. No particular agenda, just talk with everybody. And if it's only 10 minutes, that's better than nothing. But it needs to be on the schedule and they need to know that this is really about them being able to just come and talk with you. That's one homework item. For people that are really hardcore introverts and they're uncomfortable talking with strangers, there's actually a, a process for them to start to break that down. I've taught this to dozens and dozens of people. It works incredibly well. Doesn't matter how old you are. You know, you can be 17. You can have gray hair like me. It still works. So, but that's the first two months is really all about getting this core stuff set. And the next four months is all one-on-one coaching because each person has a different friction point for themselves and they need that personalized help. To be like, okay, yeah, it's talking to strangers, you know, what, how do I do it? Or networking or communicating with my team or, wow, it's really hard for me to wrap my head around these seven mental models, right? Like I get that they're valuable and I've got internal friction about them. So really that's, that's how we do it is structured. You know, if you're looking at a school context, it's like, it's like being in school for two months and then having a tutor for the next four months really, really impactful stuff. And I think as we've talked, and I'm sure the the listeners can hear my passion for this stuff, like, yeah, this is great. Uh, We need this stuff. This is what we're working on. Um, And uh, I think so impactful. What's the one thing that, that you would leave with listeners is like, hey, if you could do one thing out of what we talked about today or anything that would make it impactful, What would you kind of leave listeners with is like, hey, here's the one takeaway that like, if you go do this, this is going to make a big impact. I think it's really getting the mental model as a first level team lead. Your job is all about making everybody else more effective and having curiosity 
to figure out the knobs and levers and, and what are all the different kinds of ways to make that happen. I've done a bunch of different experiments to figure out what works and what doesn't work. You know, things that are the team asks for, but they don't change the performance versus things that people rarely ask for, but it makes a huge change in the performance. I always think about how do, how do we get 1% better every day? And, and 1% a day is tiny on a daily basis. But when you look at it at the end of the year, you're like, whoa, that was a big shift. Just helping your team be better. Yeah, I think the big point there is uh, for listeners to understand, and that you pointed out by just 1% better, is patience. Changing human behavior doesn't happen overnight. So you go, may, you may try to do a one-on-one -on -one with a guy, and it may be four weeks, and you're like, I still can't get through to this person. Well, keep trying. Keep trying. It may just be a tougher nut to crack, and then once, it, once you crack it, then, you know, that growth is, is right on the other side of that for sure. You know, it's all little baby steps, you know, like that person may actually be telling you little tiny pieces that they don't sound very big to you because it's an easy place for you, but for them, it can be really hard, you know, recognizing that everybody has different levels of what's easy for them and what's hard for them. And just because something's easy for me doesn't necessarily mean it's easy for them. And I shouldn't, I shouldn't have a negative mental filter. Because, oh, it's easy for me. Why, why isn't it easy for them? Right. I need to be like, oh, let me help you with that. Right. No matter how trivial it seems. Thanks for tuning in. If you'd like to get connected, you can find me at chadmpeterman.com. To see what our team's up to, you can visit petermanbros.com. As always, keep growing out there.